Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial and playthrough for Windward. In this video, I'll be showing you how to play the game while we're actually playing it, and if you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough, you can do so by clicking the link down below in the description or that I up in the top corner. Now before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes while we're playing, and that lets me put corrections directly on the screen that you should be able to see. Now what's going on in this game is each person is in charge of an airship that is flying around the skies of Celis. Now there are some really powerful winds on this planet, and the direction of the wind is going to change each round. Now your ship can go as far as it wants to in the direction of the wind, but it can never go straight into the wind, and this game is all about trying to fly around and hunt down these massive creatures called Crestors that are also on the planet. Now you're going to win the game by having the most notoriety, and you will get that by defeating the Crestors and bringing back their teeth to the training post, but it's just the person who brings that tooth back that gets the notoriety, so you might also want to go out and hunt down your opponents before they get back there themselves. Now I'll explain how all of this works in greater detail while we're playing, but before we jump in, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Once you're there, you'll find a bunch of ways you can support this channel, and there are some pretty cool bonuses that come along with some of those, including voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now jump into the game. Now here we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now I do want to mention that this is a prototype version of the game, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. We are going to be playing the game from the perspective of the purple player right down here, and we are the starting player, so let's go ahead and take the first turn of the game. So let's begin by focusing in on our playing area. Now on a player's turn, they can take as many actions as they want to until they decide to pass, and then the next player will go in clockwise order, and we will keep doing that until the end game is triggered. Now on our turn, we could do a wide variety of actions, and one of them involves flying around with our airship. Now you may notice that right now it's over on our playing board on the spot that says at port. This means we are currently docked at the trading post, which is the only city out on the planet of Celis. Now, I think what we should do on our first turn is right away leave the port, and when we do that, we have to spend one of our movement points. Now, we get four movement points with our airship every single turn, and when we leave port, we can go onto any of the six hexagon spaces that are adjacent to it. So, let's leave the dock and set sail right over here, and that has used one of our four airship movements for this turn. Now what we're trying to do in this game is gain as much notoriety as we can, and one of the ways that we can do that is by hunting down the red and grey Crestors that are flying around the skies of Celis. Now I think we should head right over here, and the reason for that has to do with the wind direction. Now you may have noticed this flag on top of the trading post, and it is currently pointed in this direction. Now it can point in any direction as you can see, but at the start of the game it's just like that. And that means all of the winds are blowing like this on the planet. Now when we move on the planet, we can move for free if we're going in the direction of the wind, so I figure let's go 1, 2, 3, just like that, and we still have just used one of our four movement, because again, we went in the direction of the wind. Now you may have noticed that we are very close to this red Crestor now, and if we had moved our airship onto the same spot as the red Crestor, we would fight it. Now I don't think we want to do that, because right now that red Crestor is a lot more powerful than we are. Instead, I think we want to hunt the much weaker grey Crestor over there. Now, as you can see, at the moment, we have run into a pile of floating rocks, and these are impassable for every figure in the game. This means we have to head over to that spot right there, and that is not the direction of the wind, so that means that is going to use one of our four movement, so we now have two movement points remaining. Now that we have navigated around this drift, we can head over here for free, because again, that is the current direction of the wind, and at this point, we are quite close to the Grey Crestor, and it's time to talk about the elevations of the figures out on the map. Now, you'll notice that our airship is quite tall, and the red Crestor is quite tall, but this grey Crestor is pretty short. Now, the airships and the red Crestors are on high elevation, and the grey Crestors are on low elevation. There is no way for high elevation figures to go down and interact with low elevation creatures, so what we have to do is launch a low elevation boat to send over there and fight that grey Crestor for us. So let's come back to our playing area, and you'll notice that at the start of the game we have one boat, and if we want to unlock our second boat, we can do that by hiring a harpooner or a coxswain crew member. Now I'll describe how you hire crew relatively soon, but for the moment we just need the one boat to fight that grey Crestor. So what we have to do is drop the boat, and the way we do that is with a new action. Now this is called giving orders, and you'll notice we have these two crew members over here. Now we could give orders to one of these crew members, and we can send them down to do an action that is relevant to the location where our ship is. Currently we are at Sky, which means all six of these are options, but if our airship was at port, we could go to any of these four options instead. 
Now what we want to do is deploy this boat out onto the planet, and the way we do that is by dropping the boat out. Now we can do that by ordering this crew member to go to this action spot, and that will drop this boat onto the location where our airship currently is. Now I do want to mention that we have two of these uh, crew members, and they are not allowed to do the same action twice. So now we can go ahead and drop this boat out, and it's going to land right over here underneath our airship. At this point, we now want to move the boat over here to fight this Grey Crestor, and in order to do that, we have to have some boat movement. At the start of the game, you'll notice we have zero boat moves, so what we have to do now is order this crew member over to this spot, which is going to give us plus three boat speed. We can now take this token and move it right over here, and we now have three boat movement actions that are cached up for us, and we can now spend one of these to move the boat once. So we can now move the boat onto any adjacent location to where it was, and it's important to note that since it's on the lower elevation level, it is not affected by the wind direction. So if we wanted to, we could send it right over here, but at the moment, I think instead we want to send it onto that spot, and the moment you have two opposing figures on the same spot and the same elevation, a battle will occur. So let's come back to our playing area to discuss how battles work. Now every figurine in the game has a base amount of strength, and that is listed in the bottom left portion of our player board. We can see our airship has a base strength of 2, our boat right here has a strength of 1, this grey crestor has a strength of 1, and the red crestors have a strength of 5. Now this is why we avoided that at the start of the game, obviously our airship with a strength of 2 is nothing compared to a 5, so we're going to have to build up a lot more supplies in order to take one of these on. So our boat has a strength of 1, and this grey crestor has a strength of 1, and each one of the people in the battle is going to roll these attack dice equal to the strength. Now we can see these are special dice, they have 3 1s on them, they have 2 2s, and a 3, and before this die is rolled, the player who is the aggressor gets to decide how many cannons they want to spend. Now if we had spent some time actually equipping these onto our boat, they might be right over here, and you can store 4 of them at any time, and if you discard one, you gain 1 strength, and again, that would be another die we get to roll in combat. So what happens at this point, considering we don't have any of these cannons to roll, is we simply are going to roll this die as the aggressor. So in this case, we can see that we got a 3, which is certainly a good result, and at this point, the defending player can now choose to spend cannons if they want to if we are fighting another boat or another airship. In this case, we are fighting a Crestor, and they don't have cannons, uh, and the player to the left of us is going to roll dice for them. So there is no decisions to be made, they simply have to roll this die to see how their attack resolves. And in this case, it looks like things worked out well for us, because our 3 is greater than the 2, and that means we have successfully won this battle. Now let's say instead maybe we had rolled a 1 and the Great Crestor had rolled a 3. In that case, at this point, we would have the option of spending as many of these supply cards in front of us as we wanted to. We could see the Swivel Gun lets us add 2 hits to any battle, and at this point we could use some of these plus 2 tokens that might be over in our cargo hold, and this also adds 2 to the uh, result from our dice. Now obviously we rolled higher than the Great Crestor, so we don't have to spend this card right here, and I do want to mention that if we had not been able to win, if maybe the Great Questor at the end had still had a higher number, then what would happen is our boat would be returned back to our board, and we would then gain one of these plus two tokens into our hold that we could then use in a future battle. Now the next thing I'd like to mention is what would have happened if we had tied. Now in that case, our boat would have had to go back to its previous location, and we would have gained one of these plus two tokens as well, but the boat would not have been destroyed, which is certainly nice. Although in this case, I figure let's go ahead and move on with our successful battle. This means this Grey Crestor has been defeated, and it will now be turned on its side out on the board. Now before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the other options that could have happened in battle. And in particular, I'd like to talk about battle with airships. Now they can fight Red Crestors or other people's airships, and whenever an airship loses a battle, that player is going to lose morale equal to the difference in the battle strength between them and the winning person in that battle. Now we can see over here that everybody starts the game with one morale, and if morale ever goes down to zero, then the ship will become destroyed. Now what happens is a player will lose all of the gear they had in their cargo, and it will be uh, put out onto their spot on the board, and their airship will then go right back to the port spot on their playing board, and they will immediately gain one morale, and they will get a plus two token into their cargo hold. Now I'd like to talk just a little bit more about battle, and in particular, what happens when opposing airships fight each other. Now let's say the red player won against our purple airship. Now of course we are going to lose morale equal to the difference in the battle values, and if we still have morale available to us, then we are not destroyed, and the red airship is simply going to sail on immediately to an adjacent spot to where the battle occurred, and then we would gain another one of these plus two tokens for having lost the battle.
Now, if we had instead been destroyed as part of this battle because the difference was too great, then in this case, the winning airship can take any defeated Crestor from the cargo hold of the defeated uh, airship, and they can put it into their cargo hold as long as they have space. Every airship can only hold one defeated Crestor, so that's certainly something to think about when you're going after your opponents, trying to fight them and take these Crestors. Now, after you take a Crestor from the hold, you can also take half of the other stuff in that hold, which could be Crestor teeth like this, or plus two tokens like this one right here. Now that we are done discussing battles, we need to come back to the planet, and you'll notice there is currently just one gray Crestor out here. Now you always must have a number of these on the planet equal to the number of players minus one, so in our three player game we have to have two of them out here. Now the way we can bring another one out is by rolling this standard d6, and we got a three. Now this is going to be associated with one of these zones on the board, and you'll know which zone that is based off of the numbers printed on the bottom of this trading post. So in this case, the third zone is pointing right over here, and every zone has a spot with a gray Crestor feeding ground. So this one's going to spawn right over here. And it is worth noting, if we had rolled a die value that matched a spot that already had a gray Crestor on it, or any player's boats, then we would have to roll this again until we got an empty feeding ground. All right, let's now come back out to the board, and you'll notice our boat is on the same spot as this defeated Crestor. Now, the boat is actually towing this Crestor right here, and what we need to do is tow it back to where our airship is. Now, whenever you move a boat that has a defeated Crestor on that spot, it's going to tow that Crestor along with it. So let's go ahead and use a movement to bring this right over here. And we can do that by spending one of our boat speed over here on the board. At the moment, we have just one boat speed left over that we can use. And as a free action, we can now bring this boat back on board, and it's going to tow along this gray Crestor with it. So our small boat is going to dock back into our airship, and then this gray Crestor gets towed in and put into our cargo hold. At this point, we have not actually gained any notoriety, however, because that is going to happen once we process the Crestor and bring the Crestor teeth back to the trading post. Now, I'll explain how all of that works, I think, on our next turn, but for now, let's go ahead and do another airship movement action. So let's come back out to the planet board, and at this point we have spent two movement to get all the way over here. Now I think what we should do is a free movement going here because of the wind's direction, and then we can spend our third movement going onto this Zephyr location. Now there are three of these out on the board. One is right here, the second is right over here, and the third one is hiding right behind this red Crestor right here, and whenever you are on one of these Zephyr spots, you can spend a movement to go to any of the other ones. So I think let's spend our fourth and final movement going right over here, and we've now put ourselves quite close to the trading post. Now that is important because we are going to want to go there on our next turn, and I'll explain why once we get there. I think at this point we are done with our turn. Now I do want to mention that as an action we could also spend any number of the supply cards that we have in front of ourselves. For instance, we could spend this rum to increase our crew morale, but I don't think that's something we want to do, and now that we are done with all of our actions, we can go into our end of turn phase. The way this works is we have to come back to our player board, and depending if we are at sky or at port, we are going to rest and do what it says. Obviously, if we were at port, we could rest and gain two morale. Normally, you only get one morale, but there are slight differences between each of the players, so this is something we do better. Now, we're not at port. We are currently at Sky, so we can see right here, it says we have to spend a supply card or a morale. At the moment, we should have one morale, which is what we started the game with, and we have these two cards in front of ourselves. Now, obviously, if we spent a morale right now, we would go from one to zero, and we would then become destroyed, which would leave this gray Crestor out on the board for somebody else to take, and that just does not sound like something we want to do. So instead, let's discard one of these two, and I like the idea of getting more morale on our next turn, so let's go ahead and discard this swivel gun. Now, that's going to take care of the rest penalty for being at the sky, and now we have to move a red Crestor three spaces. Now the way this works is we have to find the red Crestor that is currently in the zone where we ended our movement. Now this is going to be the one that we provoked, and it is now going to move three spaces towards us. Now if there were opposing airships in this area, we actually would not be able to move this Crestor onto them. They don't care about those airships, they specifically care about trying to get over here and attacking us. Remember these red Crestors have a strength of 5, and we have a base strength of 2, so we certainly don't want to be in a position where one of these actually catches up to us at the wrong time. In this case, we can see that this red Crestor can go 1, 2, 3, so thankfully we are one space away from being attacked. Now it is worth noting that these red Crestors are not affected by the wind's movement. They can go upwind if they need to because they are massive beasts who are strong enough to fly right into the wind. The last thing we get to do is gain one notoriety as long as we survived, of course, spending that morale or that supply, and if we survived that red Crestor moving three spaces. So let's now take one notoriety. And we can mark this by going up once on the notoriety track. 
Now you'll notice there are 15 different spaces on this track, and as soon as any one player ends their turn at 15 or more notoriety, then the end game is triggered, and all of the other players will get one more turn, and then once everybody else has taken that one turn, then the person with the most notoriety will be the winner. So uh, gaining one notoriety for being at Sky is certainly a nice thing. And at this point, our turn is officially over. Now before we move on, I'd like to talk about these achievements right down here. These are technically an advanced variant that you can play with, and when you use them, you will bring two randomly out. You'll notice this one says achievement, move 15 spaces in one turn. Now it has a three down here, and that means if you were able to move 15 spaces out on the board on a turn, you could take one of your markers and put it down onto that and immediately gain three notoriety. Each player can do each one of these achievements once per game, which is why we have these markers right over here, and some of them have two numbers. In this case, it says achievement, defeat a red crestor. So the first player to do this will get four notoriety, and any other players who do this for the rest of the game will get two notoriety for that achievement. All right, let's now move in clockwise order to the red player, and they're going to start the game at port, and for their first action, they're going to order this mate token over to this spot where they can hire crew since they are currently at port. Now the way this works is the red player can hire a veteran, a gas worker, a marine, a sergeant, a harpooner, or a coxswain. Now each one of these spots can only take one crew member and they have to take a specific one amongst those two options. And they've decided they would like to hire a marine. Now they can see already what the benefit's going to be. This says plus two hits against red crestors. And if they had instead gone for a sergeant on the spot, this would give them plus one die whenever their airship attacks. So they can grab the stack of crew members and find the marine and then put that down onto their board. They can now add this onto their board, and you'll notice it has these two cannon spots. And what this means is they went from having a maximum cannon storage of four to six. Now, it's worth noting that if they had hired a veteran or a gas worker, they would increase their gas storage from four up to six. And down here, if they had hired the harpooner or the coxswain, that would unlock the second one of their boats they could use. Now, let's quickly look at the benefits of the other crew members. We can see the harpooner says they get plus one boat strength. So that means if they took that crew member, their boats would now be worth two strength at the start of battles instead of one. The other option is the coxswain, which gives them plus one boat speed every turn, so that's a pretty nice way to keep your boats really mobile. Next up we have the veteran, and this says plus one maximum hand size. Now every player started with a number of these cards right here, and there is a max hand size of five. If you ever go over five, that's fine, but you have to immediately discard down to five, so the veteran lets you have a maximum hand size of six. The last one is the gas worker, and this says you gain plus one gas when you process the crestors. That is the action right over here, and I'll explain how that works most likely on our next turn. With the higher crew action done, the red player has now decided to once again give orders, and their other mate token is going to go here and fill one cannon. This is really simple. They just grab one cannon token, and they can put it over here into their storage. And at this point, they have decided they're not going to spend any of their cards or even launch their airship out, so they're going to leave it at port. And this means they have now come to the end of their turn, and they can rest at port. We can see for them, when they rest, they can either gain one morale, or they can gain one cannon. And that second option is what they've decided to do, so they can now add this right over here. And it looks likely that the red player is gearing up to try and be the first one to defeat a red crestor. All right, the green player can now take their turn, and the first action they want to do is to spend one of their supply cards, and this one is the arrow generator. Now we can see down here it says they can roll for a new wind direction. So they're going to roll this standard d6, and the wind direction is going to change to go in the direction that points towards that value. In this case, that is a 5, and the 5 direction, according to our trading post base, is right over there. So that means we can put this right back here, and the wind direction is going to change. It's now pointing that way across the planet. Next up, the green player wants to order this mate onto this spot, which is going to gain them one morale, bringing them from one to two. And now they've decided they want to set sail with their airship. So they're going to leave the dock onto this spot for one movement, and then for free, they're going to go all the way over here because this is the direction of the wind. Next up, they're going to spend their second movement to go onto this location, and then their third movement is going to activate this special spot. Now those two arrows mean you can go around the planet to the opposite side of the board. Now that means they can spend one action to do that, so they have now gone all the way over here and they have spent three of their movement, and they can now go one, two for free because this is still the direction of the wind. Now it is worth noting that only the airships can use this around the board action right over here. Now at this point they're going to use a fourth movement to go there, and then they'll go here for free, and now they want to keep moving. It might not be obvious to you, but what they're trying to do at this point is move 15 spaces on their turn in order to get this achievement and to take three notoriety. 
Now, there's no specific race to do this before anyone else, but getting it done right now seems like a good opportunity for them. And at the moment, they have gone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 spaces. So they have to move one more time, but unfortunately, they've used all four of their airship's movement for this turn. Well, they have a trick up their sleeve. They're now going to order this mate to go onto this spot, which is going to give them plus one ship speed, and that's going to be the fifth speed that they need. So they can now move right over here, and that is their 15th move of the turn. But you'll notice if they ended their turn right over here, they are just two spaces away from this red crest door in the zone they're in. So they are now going to go all the way over here, right next to this uh, trading post. So they've just wrapped all the way around the world, and they've traveled more than 15 spaces this turn. So they can take a green token and put it on this achievement, and that is going to give them three notoriety. At this point, the green player feels like they are done with their turn, and they have ended their turn at Sky. This means they have to either lose a morale or lose a supply card, so they're going to discard this face down to the discard pile, and then the red Crestor in their zone is going to move three spaces towards them. So this Crestor is going to move for the second time in the game, and as I said before, it can never go onto a spot with an airship of a player who did not just have their turn. So that means it cannot go one, two, three, it has to take a different route, and in this case it's going to go one, two, three, and end just behind the green player, almost like they planned it that way. At this point, the green player is still at Sky, so they can now take one Notoriety as a benefit, which means on their first turn of the game, they got four Notoriety out of the 15 that you need to end the game. Alright, play has now come back to our turn, and the first thing that we have to do is roll this d6 die. Now, we have this because we were the starting player, and at the start of every one of our turns for the entire game, we are going to roll this in order to change the wind's direction out on the planet. Currently, the wind direction is 5, so we can roll the die, and as long as we don't get a 5, we should be good. We got a 4, so we can now change this to be pointing like this, and it will stay like that until the start of our next turn, or of course, until a player plays another arrow generator card. Alright, let's now start taking actions for our turn, and we do have to make sure to clear our mate tokens off the board at the beginning of our turn. So now I think the first thing we should do is get rid of this supply card. That's going to increase our morale by 1, and the reason we're doing that will become obvious very soon. The next thing that we want to do is get notoriety for this Crestor we spent our entire first turn defeating. Now the way this works is we have to process this Crestor while we are still in the sky. In fact, we're not actually allowed to enter the trading city if we have one of these in our cargo hold. So let's go ahead and order one of our mates over here, and now what happens is we are going to process the beast, and we will get gas equal to the amount of morale our crew currently has. I guess they are more effective when they are happy. So we currently have two morale, thanks to us getting rid of this rum earlier on in the turn, and this means we are going to generate two gas, and we can put these into the gas storage spots of our ship. We can now put this Crestor back into the supply, and the last thing we do for processing is we get to take a gray Crestor tooth. You'll notice there are red Crestor teeth if we're able to defeat and process one of these red ones, and this is how we're going to finally get our notoriety. For the moment, we simply put the tooth into our cargo hold, and now I think it's time to fly over to the Trade City. When we come back to the map, we can see that the winds are somewhat favorable for us. If they had gone in this way, we would not have been able to go towards the city like this, but I suppose we could have used the Zephyr to go back over here and to try to get there that way. Either way, we can see that we can go right here for one movement, that'll be our second movement, and the third movement will put us into port. So let's put our airship back on our playing board, and the first thing we do when we enter the port is we immediately cash in any Crestor teeth we have for notoriety. The gray Crestor teeth will get us three notoriety, and the red Crestor teeth will get us four. So let's cash this in, and we will get three notoriety, which means we are now tied with the green player at four. Alright, let's now come back to our board, and we still have one mate that has not done anything, and I figure let's send them over here to take three supply cards. Currently we have no supply cards, and remember, you can spend those when you're out at Sky in order to gain notoriety instead of spending your morale, and of course, it's a good idea to hold onto morale. So by going onto the spot, we can take three cards and we can draw them from these three face-up sacks. Now the first card I think we should take is coffee. You'll notice the effect of this says plus one action. Now if we use coffee, we can actually take one of these neutral mates and do a third action on our turn, or potentially a fourth action if we spend multiple coffee. Now it's worth noting you can never do the same action twice, which is why we do have these extra tokens for it. Now we can add this into our hand and we can pick up two more cards, and this arrow generator does seem pretty nice. Uh, now you're not always gonna get the direction you need, but you know that the direction is going to change, so I figure let's take one of these so that we can potentially use that to get a more favorable win situation. At this point, we have three options left. The rum increases our morale. This heated shot lets us add one hit to any battle. And this countermeasures lets us add two hits in a battle when we are defending. 
Now, this does sound kind of nice. Our opponents might try to go out and attack us if we're able to successfully defeat more Crestors. And of course, this will help us out if a Red Crestor comes in and attacks us. If they do that and we win by using countermeasures, that actually could be really good because we know there is an achievement in order to defeat the Red Crestors. So I think our third card should probably be the countermeasures. Let's once again focus in on our playing area, and we can see that we have done both of our order actions with our mates out over here. Uh, we could potentially spend cards if we want to, and we do have one more movement with our airship if we want to send it back out to the sky. Now, at this point, I think you may be wondering, why do we have gas over here? Now, in order to answer that, let's go back to the supply board. When we focus back up here, we can see there are five options listed just above the notoriety board, and these are the five ways that you can spend gas as an action on your turn. We can see this one says you can fill one cannon by spending one gas. Now that is just the same as spending a mate to get a cannon. Of course, you don't have to use the mate, but you do have to use the gas from your supplies. Next up, you can hire a crew member, and this is going to cost two gas. After that, you can spend one gas to increase the morale on your ship. You can also spend two gas to go up once on the notoriety track. And lastly, you can spend one gas to get three more supply cards. In this case, we have two gas at the moment, and we win the game by having the most notoriety, so I figure let's spend both of these to gain one notoriety, which is going to put us in the lead with five. With our gas gone, we can come back to our playing board, and now I think let's use our coffee card. This is going to give us one more action, and as I mentioned before, we can use one of these neutral mates, and I think let's put it right down over here. As you can see, uh, we have a special ability to gain two morale instead of the normal one, so that means we will go right up to four. And now I think the last thing we should do is spend our fourth and final airship movement to once again leave the port. This means we can come out onto any of the six spots around the trading post, including this spot right here, and if we did that, we would attack the green player's airship, but I don't really see a reason to do that at the moment. Instead, I figure let's pop right out here, and now we are going to be done with our turn. This means we are going to go into the end of phase for our turn while we are in the sky. So we have to perform this rest, and we can spend a supply or a morale, and considering we have four morale, let's just spend one of those, bringing us to three. Now we have to move the uh, red crestor that we just provoked in that region, and it's going to go three spaces towards us. Lastly, we are still at sky, so we're going to gain one more notoriety, which means we have ended our second turn with six notoriety overall, and I think we're doing pretty good in the game so far. With our turn done, the red player can now go, but at this point, I think it's now time to talk about these gas pockets that are spread around the outside of the board. Each one of them starts the game with two gas tokens on them, and if a player ever moves through these spots, they get to take these gas tokens and put them onto their ship. These never refill as we're playing the game, so they're just incentivizing players to get to these locations. At this point, I think we have taught most of the rules to the game, and this is going to bring us to the end of the tutorial. If you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough, you can do so by clicking the link down below in the description, or that I up in the top corner, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Windward. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.